Well, good morning, City Light Church. Uh, I want to start by letting all of you know that back in 2000, it was actually me and not Gavin that was voted by our high school senior class the least likely to ever be seen on a fashion catwalk. <laughs> and yet, here I am as a living testimony to the fact that all things are possible with God. And if you'll allow me, this particular ensemble was inspired by Bumgar's Farm and Home <laughs> and features a stylish, pair, a stylish pair of Wolverine steel toe work boots and a pair of khaki pants that are both stylish, rugged, and waterproof because they're made from fire hose. <laughs> that felt really good, just to, just to pretend for a second. Um, no, for, for those of you who uh, are wondering, who's this jabroni? I want you to know that's a really fair question uh, because the truth is I am not an ordained minister. I'm not a uh, licensed to be here. Uh, the, the truth is, despite Gavin's uh, really warm introduction, I, I'm just regular, the same as anybody else here this morning. Uh, Monday through Friday, I work in a factory. I'm a husband to my wife, Amy, and a father to our two kids, Kendall and Lando. And in whatever spare time I do have, I volunteer here at City Light Church. Uh, nothing overly special. But there was a time in my past uh, when I actually used to dream about going into full-time ministry. And as Gavin alluded, I actually did do a two-year pastoral internship at Christ Community here in town. And it was during that internship that I actually realized that I am not cut out for full-time ministry. In fact, I can remember the exact day when I realized it. I'm going to share a story with you this morning. Um, it, it was during our internship, and everyone on staff was given a day to pray and to meditate and to read scripture, which are all just really good pastoral things to do. And uh, the whole church was opened up for us, just find a place. And I remember that I wound up in the sanctuary at Christ Community. And I don't know if any of you have ever been in that church or in the sanctuary, but it's a, it's a huge space. It's, it's cavernous. It's made to seat like 1,500 people or something crazy. And I was in there all by myself. And I remember I hit my knees and, uh, and I, I tried to pray. And there was nothing coming to me. And I wrestled to come up with something, and when I couldn't come up with anything at all, I grabbed a, a Bible out of the pew, and I opened it up, and I tried to read in the Old Testament, and, and it was really dry and not happening for me there either. And, uh, and, and I remembered, I'm horrible at quiet times. And so I think, well, it's probably time to go, but then I looked, and it's only been like 15 minutes. So I realized I've got to come up with a distraction to get through it, when all of a sudden, across the sanctuary... I saw it. It was, it was the perfect distraction. It was like Moses in the burning bush, a profoundly spiritual moment, only it wasn't a burning bush. It was the exact opposite. It was a four-foot-tall fire extinguisher, and I'd never seen anything like it. And I, before I knew it, I was all the way across the sanctuary checking this thing out, and I remember I walked up to it, and it came up to like here on me. And I I'm not kidding you. If we were to take this fire extinguisher to Worlds of Fun, this thing could erode the timber wool. It was huge. And I'm like, I've got to pick this up. I've got to see what a four-foot fire extinguisher weighs. And so I grab it, and it thing weighs like 100 pounds. I've never seen anything like it. Why would they make a fire extinguisher this big? And I started getting really excited for the first time that day. And I, I thought, I've got to go find somebody and tell them about this thing. But then I remembered everyone else in the church was reading their Bible and praying. And so I felt horrible because I just wasted like 20 minutes ogling over a fire extinguisher. And so I drug my feet back to my Bible and I tried to pick it up. I really tried, guys. But the temptation was on. My head was sweating, my palms. I couldn't focus. I remember looking at my Bible and it was like the words just went blurry and it was like they were getting further and further away, and I don't know if I blacked out or if I just chose to not remember, but the next thing I know, I find myself holding the fire extinguisher again, and, and I'm having this fantasy about saving Christ Community Church from a ravenous forest fire, and it was at that moment that something deep down inside me recognized that I've got to save myself from the coming disaster. 
Because I can remember clear as day looking across the sanctuary at my Bible and then looking back at the fire extinguisher and then back at my Bible and then back at the fire extinguisher. And it was like my Bible was telling me, Todd, put down the fire extinguisher. But it was like the, bi- it was like the, the fire extinguisher was telling me, pull the pin. You know you want to. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know why I did it. But I pulled the pin out of the fire extinguisher. I don't know if it was sin or if it was my single digit IQ or what it was, but I pulled the pin out and I thought to myself, just a little shot. I just got to see what this thing can do. And so I remember I looked to my left and then I looked to my right because that's what you always do before you do something insanely stupid or sinful and there was nobody else around. So I grabbed the trigger and I just, I gently pulled it. And this sucker took off like a Boeing 747. It was three seconds of this. Followed by a cloud of smoke. You couldn't see across the room. And so I, I, I set the fire extinguisher down and then this is what I did. I did, I, I, in, I I panicked. That's what it looks like when you panic. And I couldn't think of what to do next. And so I did the only thing I could think of, the most mature thing I could possibly do. I took off running. I just ran. I set the first down and I ran. I ran out of the sanctuary. I ran down the hall. I just kept running. I stopped. I got a side cramp, so I stopped running. But I, I, and I, uh, I, I remember thinking at that moment, what have I done? I'm on staff at Christ Community, and I just smoked the sanctuary. <laughs> I am such a moron. And, and so I paced back and forth for like five minutes, but, but nothing happened. No smoke alarms went off, and nobody came running. And so I started to think, maybe I got away with it. Maybe nobody will notice that I, that I set off this fire extinguisher. And so... I, I went back to my office, I tiptoed through the atrium, through all the people that were on the ground praying and stuff, and I, and I went to my office and I opened my email and I had one new message, and I'll never forget the subject line. It was an all staff email at Christ Community, it came from the property director, and the subject line read, someone set off a fire extinguisher in the sanctuary. Really? Question mark, exclamation point, question mark. In my heart sunk. I am such an idiot. And 20 minutes earlier, I couldn't pray to save my life. But now I'm praying and the words are coming really easy. I remember I started, I said, God, I did it again. I did it again. I screwed up. God, help me. You got to bail me out. Lord, what do I do? I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. What should I do? And the funny thing was, on that particular day, God was talking to me too. I could hear his instruction very clearly. He said, Todd, you've got to go to that property director and confess that you're an idiot. (laughs) And and I didn't want to do that. So I, you know, I wrestled with God like Jacob in the Old Testament. I thought maybe I could get him to change his mind, but he he held firm on the whole you're an idiot thing. And so I I finally gave in and I said, okay, Lord. And I, I took the longest walk of my life down that hallway to, to see the property director. And I knocked on the door. He told me to come in. And when I came in, I couldn't look him in the eye. I came in with my head down like this. And I said, Israel, that was his name, Israel. I said, Israel, I shot off the fire extinguisher in the sanctuary. And I told him all about the bad quiet time and the fire extinguisher fantasy and the pin and the side cramp. I told him everything, spilled my guts. And he didn't say a word. And so I stood there staring at the ground and nothing. It was just dead quiet. And I realized he's going to make me make eye contact. And so I kind of <laughs> I kind of brought my head around. And when, he, when, when I looked at him, he looked right at me in my eyes, over the brim of his glasses, expressionless face, just. And he finally, he said, I'll never forget what he said. He said, Todd, let's just keep this a secret between us. And if anyone asks, we'll blame it on some rogue junior high kids. And, and I learned two things on that day. One, when somebody shows you grace in a moment like that, you take it. Because 
It doesn't matter how good your last job performance review was once you've set off a fire extinguisher in the sanctuary. You are dependent on grace in that moment. And the second thing that I learned is that I actually have a believable emotional maturity level to that of a rogue junior high kid. <laughs> and I wanted to tell that story on my morning to preach here because I thought it was really important for all of you guys to understand the caliber of the church planner that it took to make the team here at City Light. <laughs> no, the, the, the real reason that I, I chose to tell that story this morning is because I, I felt like it was really important that everyone here know that I'm a sinner and I am in need of grace. I've got all kinds of train wreck stories in my past. And the truth is, I don't think I'm that much different than anyone else here this morning. It's what I love about City Light. We've all set off our fair share of fire extinguishers. We've all had embarrassing and stupid and sinful moments in our past. We all came in here with stories that we'd rather not have aired in front of our friends or our family, and especially from on stage. But the one thing that binds all of us together in this room is that each one of us needs grace. We're all desperate for the grace of Jesus Christ. And the question that drives us to scripture this morning is in that moment, in that moment when we need it the most, when we stand before the throne of God, will we take it? Will we accept the grace of Jesus Christ? And to answer that question this morning, I want you to open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 31. This morning, we're actually going to be taking a look at what looks like two different stories. Uh, first, the little children in Jesus and then the story of the rich young ruler in Jesus. And many of you are probably already familiar with both of these stories because they're among the most famous in all of Scripture. But this morning, we're going to try and take a look at them maybe in a little bit different light. And what I'll contend this morning is that the story of Jesus and the little children and the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler are actually two parts to one story. There's one prevening message that runs through both of them, and that's what I want to find this morning. If you look through the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one of the things that you'll find is that both of these stories are always told together. It's always first the story of Jesus and the little children followed immediately by the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler. And in both stories, you find someone approach Jesus and you find Jesus teaching about the kingdom of heaven to the disciples. And so that's where we wanna be this morning. And we wanna start by taking a look at the story of Jesus and the little children. So what we find starting in verse 13, is that a line of people with, with young children has formed in front of Jesus. And what they're looking for is they're just, they're looking for Jesus to lay his hands on the children and to pray for them and to bless them, very, very simply. And what we read is that when the disciples saw the kids lining up, they told them to scram. They told them to get lost. Actually, the Bible says they rebuked them. So they didn't just send them away but they made the little kids feel bad for even asking to take Jesus' time. And when Jesus sees this, his response is that he gets mad. Actually, it says he gets indignant even. And he looks at the disciples and he's like, really, guys? You're going to make a bunch of little kids feel bad because, you, because they want me to pray for them? And he tells the disciples, get out of their way. Don't hinder them. Let the little children come, come to me. And he says, I want this to be a teaching moment for all of you. So he gathers the disciples around, and he teaches them about the kingdom of heaven. And this is what he says. He says, the, the kingdom of God belongs to, uh, belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then he goes on to take the children in his arms, and he prays for them and blesses them. And then we presume that the kids, having been blessed, go on about their way. But the story isn't over. It's actually only half over. Because Jesus hasn't even moved from the place where he had just promised the kingdom of heaven to these children when he's approached again, this time by a rich, young ruler. And you'll notice that where these little children didn't make it past the VIP rope, the disciples were quick to intercept them and turn them away. The rich young ruler has no problems getting right to Jesus' feet because he's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. He's a big deal. If there was anyone in all of Scripture who looked like they deserved Jesus' audience, it might have been this guy. And he comes right to Jesus' feet, he hits his knees, and he says, Good teacher. 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? Because he's thinking, if these kids whom I just saw promised the kingdom of heaven get what they get, just think of what someone like me might inherit. But there were problems from the start. Jesus says immediately, why have you chosen to call me good when God alone is good? And the reason that that's important to Jesus is because Jesus needs to know, do you think that I'm the son of God? Or do you just think that I'm a good teacher? And so Jesus goes on to list the commandments that he knows this man knows. And the rich young ruler replies, teacher. Notice he doesn't call him good. So there's the answer to that assumption. I have kept all of these since I was a boy. So here we go on to find out that addition, in addition to being rich, young, and powerful, this young ruler is also morally perfect by his own account. He's kept every commandment since he was a boy. And the Bible says that in spite of his obvious arrogance, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And so Jesus said, there's only one thing left to do. Go and take all of your possessions and sell them and give the money to the poor. And then come and follow me. But at this, the rich young ruler drops his head and turns away. Because as scripture said, he had great wealth. Then just as Jesus had done with the little children, he gathers all the disciples around again. And he says, hey, lesson number two on the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. And the disciples are amazed because no one has ever taught like this before. And so Jesus says it again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples still can't believe it. And so Jesus beats that dead horse a third time when he goes on to say that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so the disciples finally ask him, if not someone like him, then who? And Jesus says, aha, with man it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible with God. And so Peter speaks up, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus goes on to explain that if you've left anything for the sake of him or for the gospel, it will be given back to you a hundredfold in the time to come. But in the end, many who are first will be last, and the last will be made first. City Light Church, this morning, I want to contend that the very power of the gospel is revealed in Mark chapter 10 in the difference between a group of little children and a rich and powerful ruler. These stories belong together because they teach one lesson. The key to the kingdom of heaven is and always will be the grace of Jesus Christ alone. It's Jesus plus nothing else. In our story this morning, the little children come to Jesus and they have nothing. They don't even deserve his earthly audience. They come to him with nothing. But the rich young ruler comes to Jesus with a very impressive resume. He's done everything by the world's standard. But what we learned this morning is that only one got in and one was turned away. The little kids got in. And so this morning, we're going to talk about grace. Because grace is both an amazing and a humbling thing. It's an adjective for the weak. The proud will never accept grace. But a child, a child is intrinsically different. You can take my daughter, for instance. My daughter is five. And she trusts Jesus as her savior, not because she's made an analytical decision based on the veracity of scripture. No, that's not it at all. She, she trusts the truth that her mother and I have taught her, and she loves Jesus, and she trusts that Jesus loves her, and she figures that as long as she loves Jesus and Jesus loves her, Jesus will figure it out. She has faith in Jesus. She's five. She's not trying to earn her salvation. She's just trusting in Jesus. She's five. She's never earned anything in her entire life. I'm not even sure if she understands the concept of earning something because that's what it means to be a child. It's to be dependent upon grace. To be a child is to depend on someone else. It's to trust, to have faith that someone loves me and because someone loves me, I will be fed. Because someone loves me, 
I will be cared for. Because if someone loves me just for who I am, all the things that I need will be taken care of. That's what it means to be a little child. And the most amazing thing about all of it is, is this is the way that Jesus tells us to come to him, to have faith in grace. Kids get it. Salvation is by faith in Jesus through grace alone. And they don't just accept it. That is kids. They don't just accept it. They think it's great. Jesus loves me not because of anything that I've done. He loves me because he's Jesus and because he's awesome and because he's good and because he's God and I trust him. That's the way a little child comes to Jesus. You guys want to know the absolute most crazy thing about heaven? There's not one person in all of heaven that deserves to be there. Let me say it again. There's not one person in all of heaven who deserves to be there. That's grace. And it's a wonderful thing, and it's something that we all should love. But what we learned this morning is that grace isn't for everybody. It's an adjective that only the weak will accept. And in the end, it's something only, that only belongs to those who can humble themselves like a little child and accept it. This is why Jesus said how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the more accomplished we become in this world, the less likely we are to depend upon grace. It's true. Jesus knew that it was true. It's a symptom of our human condition, and it's called pride. And it's pride more than any other sin that will keep us from the kingdom of heaven and a life eternally spent enjoying Jesus. The problem is when we hear Jesus say how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, for some of us, our automatic default is to think, well, I better try harder. I better get to work. I better button up my bootstraps and get after it. But Jesus didn't mean hard as in it's hard. Jesus meant hard as in it's impossible, as in there's no way. And if you're having trouble wrapping your mind around that this morning, I don't want you to feel bad because the disciples didn't get it either. They didn't understand the teaching. And so Jesus finally had to put this in terms that they could understand. He said it would be easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than it would be for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And that visual is so powerful that I decided that I was going to try and recreate it this morning. And so I know you've all been wondering, underneath my blanket here, I have a camel. <laughs> Only it's not really a camel, it's a four-foot stuffed horse, because I couldn't find a camel. But horses are kind of like camels, and I think the visual is still powerful irregardless. If I was to ask anyone in this room to come on stage this morning and to take this four-foot horse camel and shove it through the eye of a needle, does anyone really think they could get her done? You're more than welcome to try. Take a needle, shove him on through. The point is that it's ridiculous. Not only can it not be done, but it's a ridiculous idea. And you know what's even more ridiculous than the idea that you can shove this horse camel through a needle? The idea that you can earn your way into the kingdom of heaven. That's a ridiculous idea. There's no way. It can't be done. And Jesus knew that it couldn't be done. And so Jesus gave everyone an example that they could never forget. A camel in the eye of a needle. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has thread that needle for us. Jesus goes on to teach that all things are possible with God. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. City Light, for those of you that haven't made the decision yet, let me ask you, are you ready? Are you ready to let Jesus thread that needle for you? Or this morning as you sit there, are you still convinced that you can shove it through there on your own? This morning, you have the opportunity to walk out of this church a changed person, a person filled with joy and with the assurance of an eternal life in heaven, not because of anything that you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. 
Jesus is ready to thread that needle. And if you're ready to come to him this morning as a child in need of grace, you're ready to walk out of here a changed person, a person who has an eternity to look forward to. City Light Church, in a nutshell, this is our gospel. This is our truth. Our salvation is not by anything that we have done, but by the grace of Jesus Christ alone. And I could not faithfully preach this text this morning without asking you. In that day when you stand before the judgment throne, which one are you going to be? A child in need of grace or a rich young ruler in search of your reward? The decision that you make on that day will have a profound impact on the rest of your life. Practically, what it means for us as a Christian, first it means that as a child of God, we don't have to pretend anymore. We don't have to pretend that we're something that we're not because we've already confessed that we need grace. It's by grace alone that we are saved. And because we've confessed that our salvation is only through Jesus, we don't have to be something that we're not. We're all confessing that we all need grace. We're trying. We're doing it together. We're all dependent upon Jesus. That's the brilliance of the church of Jesus Christ. We have a place where we can all struggle and be honest together. We're all suffering. We're all suffering through this world. We're suffering with sin and with temptation. We're all suffering with anger, and we're suffering with jealousy, and we're suffering from pride. Some of us this morning are suffering with alcohol and addictions like drugs and things like that. Some of us are suffering as we struggle with our sexuality. We're struggling as we struggle with things like pornography and sin. We're struggling with things like fire extinguishers. Maybe not as much fire extinguishers, but we're not going to judge the people who do because we're all struggling. It's the, it's the brilliant thing about the church. It's the thing about the church that I love the most. We have a family. As children of God, we're all family, and we're in it together. Nobody is going to come into this church to be judged. May that be our prayer. We're not here to judge anyone, but we're here to struggle together and to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. And that's a model of the church that gets me very excited to be here this morning. So City Light, instead of being a church full of religious pretenders, I want to ask, can we be a church full of broken and humble and honest people that simply need the grace of Jesus Christ together? The second practical application to this story this morning that I want to point out is that as a child of God, we should be able to live a life that's free from the power of money and from the temptations that go with it. Now, I want to make this clear. Money by itself is fine but it should have no power in the life of a child of God. And I want to go back to our stories just for a second and point out one obvious difference. Did anybody notice that when Jesus welcomed the little children to himself, he didn't tell the children to go and give their money to the poor? And as I read through commentaries, I found that, that the assumption is, well, they must not have had money. But the, the truth is, we don't know if they had money or not. And I think the real difference between the two stories is that to a child, whether they had money in their pocket or they didn't have money in their pocket, money has no power. And if you don't believe me, you can walk into the toddler room in our, in our youth area this morning and you can ask any toddler for a dollar. If they have one, they'll just give it to you. It has no power over them. They can't eat it. They can't play with it. The amazing thing about children is money has no intrinsic value to them. And so we as parents spend years and years just trying to instill in our children a value for money. And the great irony in it all is that as a child of God, we have to relearn everything that we know about money all over again. Because once we accept that our money can't buy our way into heaven, and once we realize that we can't take any of the junk that money buys with us, we should be freed from the power it has over us, and we should be able to live a life where we can give that money away and be generous to those in need, where we can take that money and instead store up treasure in heaven with it that moth and rust can't destroy and that no one can take from us. These aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus himself as he taught about money. 
And so City Light, I want to ask you this morning, if you look at your life, assess how much power do money and possessions still have in the life that you're living as a Christian? I want to know, does, does, are you making sacrifices? Are you making sacrifices in your marriage or with your children to pay the mortgage on that right house in the right neighborhood? I want to know, are you sacrificing your witness at work so that you can get ahead in that rat race for the promotion? I want to know, are you able to be generous to those in need? Or are your debts requiring you right now to keep everything for yourself? This morning, I'm teaching on money, because, not because I want anybody to feel guilty because of the situation that you might find yourself in this morning, but because I want you to know the immeasurable joy and freedom that's been won for us as children of Christ. You see, as a Christian, we shouldn't have to make these sacrifices because all of these are revolving around things that we don't need. That's the great truth of the gospel. We don't need any of these things. We don't need to change our lifestyles. What we, or we do need to change our lifestyles, but what we don't need is a bunch of things. As Christians, we don't need stuff. We don't need to keep up with the Joneses. We don't need a fancy title. We don't need to be a big deal. We don't need anything but Jesus because there's nothing left that we need to earn. When we confess that our salvation is by grace, we can finally have rest in knowing that there's nothing more than Jesus that we need. And so when our friends and our family and our neighbors and our coworkers look at our life, and ask us where our joy comes from, it would be my prayer that our only answer would be Jesus. And when they see the way that we love and the way that we serve and the way that we give grace in abundance and they want to know why, we don't need to show them anything but Jesus. And one day when we stand before the throne of God and we're asked to give an account for our life, we can look at God, see Jesus, and say, I'm with him. That's the brilliance of the gospel. It's not about anything that we've done. It's not about anything that we can do. It's not about a resume that we can argue. It is now and always be about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. City Light, let's be a church that's known for our love and our grace. But most of all, it is our prayer this morning that we would be a church that is known for our total and undeniable dependence upon Jesus. Amen? It's good stuff. Let me pray for us. Father God, Lord, we, we come to you humbly this morning, uh, just as little children. And God, we know that we've done nothing to deserve your audience, but God, we have faith that Jesus has done a great work for us. And so we come to you, Father, in the name of Jesus as your children, crying out for your grace and your mercy and your love to be poured out upon us. Jesus, we pray that you would remake our hearts. Help us to refine that childlike innocence, God, that, that faith that we were born with, God, that we've, that we've ruined by putting it in everything else but you. God, may all our faith be yours this morning. May all that we argue be yours this morning. May your name, Jesus, be on our lips, and may it be our answer for every question that we're given about the joy that we've found. Lord, we pray all these things that you might be glorified in us as we look forward to that day when we meet you in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen.